been several hard months of winter, snow, cold, and wind. Spring has finally come to the Midwest. Warmth, flowers, and finally getting outside. But with the warmer weather comes an annual danger. Tornadoes and severe thunderstorms. It's something we expect living in Tornado Alley. But what can you do to keep you and your family safe? Are you prepared? The KTIV First Alert Team is here with the tips you need to know now before the storm threatens your neighborhood. This is a KTIV First Alert Weather Special. Staying safe in Siouxland storms. Now, here's First Alert Chief Meteorologist, Ron DeMars. Hello and welcome to this First Alert Weather Special, covering what you need to know about severe weather as we enter this season of dangerous conditions here in Siouxland. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll cover what severe weather is, look back at the impact it's had on Siouxland in recent years, and show you what you need to do to stay safe and weather aware this and every season. So let's start with just what we mean by severe weather. There are a number of types of dangerous weather events that can fit under this umbrella, like floods, severe thunderstorms, and of course, tornadoes. All of those have special alerts that will come from the National Weather Service to let people know what dangerous weather is either possible or that it's on its way. We'll go in depth with each of those coming up, but first, let's start with the most iconic type of severe weather, the tornado. Siouxland is located in what's known as Tornado Alley, a popular, if unofficial, term for the central United States where tornadoes are known to happen more frequently than in other parts of the country. Here in Siouxland, we've seen a number of large and devastating tornadoes hit our area over the past 20 years. One of the biggest tornadoes to hit Siouxland was actually a pair of tornadoes that hit the village of Pilgrim, Nebraska on June 16, 2014. Both of them were rated an EF4 with winds of between 166 and 200 miles per hour. According to the National Weather Service, both tornadoes were 500 yards wide each. That's more than a quarter mile wide. 20 people were injured by those tornadoes and two people died. Less than a year before the Pilger Twin Tornadoes, another northeast Nebraska community was hit by an EF4 storm. Wayne, Nebraska was impacted by an EF4 tornado on the evening of October 4th, 2013 as part of a tornado outbreak that also saw storms hit Woodbury and Plymouth counties in Iowa and Union County of South Dakota. The National Weather Service says the tornado that hit Wayne was nearly a mile and a half wide at its peak, destroying several homes and businesses and injuring 15 people. Thankfully, no deaths were reported from this storm. The Wayne tornado was unique for its timing, with the state averaging just three tornadoes in the month of October between 1991 and 2010, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. A notable outbreak of tornadoes in northwest Iowa happened on the night of April 9, 2011. One of the strongest of those was an EF3 rated storm that directly impacted the Monona County community of Mapleton, damaging or destroying more than half of the buildings in that community. That twister was nearly a mile wide and resulted in nearly two dozen injuries. The same system that spawned that tornado also put tornadoes on the ground near Early and Pocahontas, one of which remained on the ground for 30 miles. Without question, the deadliest tornado to hit Siouxland in recent years was the Little Sioux tornado in June of 2008, which actually began in Nebraska, then crossed the Missouri River into Iowa. That storm hit the Little Sioux Scout Ranch, where dozens of boys' scouts were camping. It destroyed most of the buildings on the ranch, killing four scouts and injuring nearly 50 others. The National Weather Service says that storm was an EF3 when it hit the camp, destroying a number of buildings on the ranch. So what is the EF scale that we keep talking about? Well, it was founded by Dr. Fujita. He came up with this uh, tornado rating system, basically, is what it is. He made some changes to it as time went along, so it became the enhanced Fujita scale. And EF zeros and EF ones are the weakest kind of tornadoes on this scale. So with an EF zero with winds between 65 and 86 miles per hour, that is when you're going to see some shingles uh, peeled off of a house, maybe some damage to gutters and siding and things like that. Then it just keeps getting worse from there. With an EF1 tornado with winds up to 110 miles per hour, you start to see windows broken out of a house, significant roof damage, which then becomes roofs being completely ripped away, unfortunately, with an EF2 tornado. That has winds of up to 135 miles per hour. An EF3 tornado, that's getting pretty big now at this point because vehicles can be displaced from where they were. Entire floors are uh, destroyed from homes. 
But with an EF4, it becomes even worse. Entire homes can be leveled at that point. Cars are thrown into the air. And then once you get into the EF5 range of over 200 miles per hour for the winds, uh, homes are completely swept away. Concrete is sometimes ripped from the ground. And grass can be ripped from the ground as well. The most common form of severe weather is the severe thunderstorm, and we can't have a program on severe weather safety without understanding what a severe thunderstorm is. So the definition of a severe thunderstorm is a storm that produces one inch diameter hail or greater, which would mean quarter size or larger, or wind gusts of 58 miles per hour or higher. If a storm meets one of these two criteria, the National Weather Service will issue a severe thunderstorm warning. That brings us to understanding the difference between a watch and a warning. A watch is what is issued by the Storm Prediction Center out of Norman, Oklahoma. A watch means conditions will be favorable for severe storms to occur. A watch covers a large area and will last for several hours. During this time, we have to keep an extra eye to the sky and stay aware of the weather situation around us. A warning, on the other hand, means that severe weather is likely within that area. A warning covers a much smaller area and will typically last about 30 to 60 minutes. When a warning is issued in the area where you are, it's time to take action and make sure you're doing what is best to stay safe from the storm. A warning means severe weather is happening now, and depending on the type, it may mean you need to take shelter. First Alert meteorologist Kat Taylor shows us how to find shelter from the storm, no matter where you are when the warning is issued. Seconds matter. When a tornado warning is issued, you may only have moments to protect yourself and your family. That's why you need to figure out where you're going to go at home, at work, or out and about. The safest place to go in a tornado is a tornado shelter, but a basement works just as well. If you don't have a basement, you'll want to find a room where you can house your entire family, including pets. Go to the lowest floor of your home and put as many walls between you and the outside as possible without windows. Usually that's an interior closet, bathroom, or hallway. Make it extra safe by putting pillows, blankets, and even a helmet in with you. If you're in your car, try to find the nearest sturdy building and drive there. Do not try to outrun a tornado. If you can't find safe shelter, you have to make a choice. Either stay in your vehicle and hunker down as low as you can, or exit the vehicle and get into a ditch or ravine, lay flat, cover your head and neck with your hands. If your apartment building is without an interior hallway, your best bet is heading over to the leasing office or making friends with your downstairs neighbor. RVs, mobile homes, and manufactured houses are perfectly good places to live, but they're not safe in a tornado because they're just not built to withstand 80 mile per hour winds or higher. If you live in a mobile home, take shelter by driving to a nearby sturdy building, preferably one with a basement. If there's no shelter nearby, lie flat in the nearest ditch, ravine, or culvert and cover your head with your hands. Long span buildings, such as department stores, theaters, or gyms, are especially dangerous because the roof is usually supported only by the outside walls. Most buildings like this cannot withstand the pressure from a tornado, they simply collapse. Most department stores that you go in will have a severe weather plan, very much like Baumgars. Here at Baumgars, we have a shelter area in our assembly area where we also have provisions just in case of an emergency. If for some reason a department store you're in does not have a plan, you're gonna wanna find a small room like an office or refrigeration unit. If any of those aren't available, huddle up against the shelves to protect yourself from falling debris from the roof. Most large venues have a plan to shelter both staff and attendees of a large event if a tornado strikes. They have designated shelters that are perfectly adequate and designed to house a lot of people. So here at the Tyson Event Center, we do have a variety of plans for different weather-related emergencies, including a tornado plan, and we do have designated areas here in the building if a tornado were to strike. While most venues will have a tornado safe plan, some may not. If that's the case, duck down in between the seats, cover your head to be safe from falling debris. When in doubt, ask yourself these questions to figure out if you are ready for the storm. Is my location sturdy enough to provide shelter? Is there a neighbor, friend, or family member with a sturdy house I can go to? And if not, find a nearby sturdy building, church, business, or public shelter. You can find more information on sheltering at ready.gov.
While it may be tempting to shelter under an overpass, it is exceedingly dangerous. Attempting to protect your car from hail could lead you to a confrontation with a tornado. Winds become constricted underneath an overpass, and when constricted, wind speeds increase dramatically, very much like when you put your finger over a garden hose. These extremely fast winds can suck people out from under the overpass and deposit mounds of debris. Parking under an overpass can cause accidents with other vehicles, and this is why it's not a safe place to seek shelter. While they're not as well known as tornadoes, storms with high winds that don't rotate can be just as dangerous. Known as straight line winds, the National Weather Service says they're actually responsible for more wind-related damage reports from thunderstorms than tornadoes. One form of damaging straight line winds is the downburst, which happens when air is dragged down from the atmosphere by precipitation. When that air reaches the ground, it spreads out across the land in a straight line and can reach speeds of more than 100 miles per hour. A long-lived storm with strong straight-line winds can also be called a derecho. Typically, those storms include a damage path that's at least 400 miles long and 60 miles wide, with winds of at least 58 miles per hour. Siouxland has become well acquainted with this type of storm in recent years, with a big derecho in 2020 actually beginning in western Iowa and proceeding across the state of Iowa, with the strongest winds being recorded in Cedar Rapids at nearly 140 miles per hour. All told, that storm did nearly $11 billion in damage across Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana. While thunderstorms and tornadoes are dangerous, they're not the most deadly form of severe weather. We'll dive deeper into the dangers of flooding coming up. But first, more on one of the most dangerous parts of a thunderstorm, the lightning, and how you can use it to find out how close you are to a storm when this First Alert weather special continues. Lightning is one of the highlights of any thunderstorm, and while it can be nice to watch, it can also be dangerous. The National Weather Service says there's a quick way to determine how close a storm is to you using thunder and lightning. If you see lightning, count the number of seconds between when you see the lightning and when you hear the thunder. Then divide that number by five to find out how many miles away the storm is. For example, if you see lightning and don't hear thunder for 15 seconds, the storm is three miles away from you. First Alert Meteorologist Carmelo Lutuca has more now on the dangers of lightning and how to stay safe when you see it in the sky. While some thunderstorms contain flooding rains, damaging winds, large hail, or even tornadoes, there is one thing all thunderstorms have in common, thunder. And we know that thunder is always playing catch up to its more dangerous counterpart, lightning. So what should you do when lightning strikes? Well, first and foremost, when thunder roars, go indoors. It's a very common saying, but a very important one as well. And see a flash, dash inside. That's very important for those who are hearing impaired, but regardless, if you see lightning, you should be heading inside immediately. You wanna stay inside of an enclosed building or vehicle, that's gonna keep you the most safe. And last, but certainly not least, Wait at least 30 minutes from the last time you hear thunder before going back outside. 5, 10, 15 minutes is just not going to cut it. So now you know what to do and where to go, but what should you avoid? Well, you should avoid water, pools, showers, that sort of thing. Water is a very good conductor of electricity and could harm you during a thunderstorm. You will not want to go under trees or staying inside an open enclosure. Those are not safe by any means. And similar to the water rule, avoid anything that is plugged in. A computer that is charging, a microwave, could seriously harm you during a thunderstorm if you are using it. You might think if a storm is off into the distance that you are relatively safe. But lightning can strike as far as 10 miles away from a storm, making places such as this baseball field suddenly dangerous. Well, we've learned a lot about lightning together so far, but there still might be a few things that you might not know. For instance, if you live to be 80 years old, the odds that you'll be struck in your lifetime are 1 in 20,000. Additionally, between 2006 and 2023, there were seven fatalities between Iowa, Nebraska, and South Dakota combined. And lastly, heat lightning. It's far enough away where you do not hear the thunder, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't head indoors when you see it. So whether you're enjoying a sunny day like today, or you hear these tornado sirens going off, remember lightning is a danger with any thunderstorm that is currently approaching, overhead, or even exiting. In Sioux City, Carmelo Latuca, KTIV News 4. 
There are also a lot of myths associated with lightning and how to stay safe from it. The National Weather Service says it's not true that Benjamin Franklin's kite was ever hit by lightning. And following on from that, it's not true that lightning only strikes the tallest object in a particular area. Lightning can strike any object, not just metal. Also, just because it's not raining doesn't mean you can't be struck by lightning. In fact, the NWS says most people who are struck by lightning each year are in rain-free areas miles away from a thunderstorm. And finally, rubber-soled shoes or rubber tires are not insulators from lightning and in fact offer zero protection from that lightning. Siouxland has a rich history of flooding. With so many rivers and streams moving through our area, a strong storm could see some or all of them coming out of their banks. While some parts of Siouxland see flooding almost every year, there are some floods that are so big and widespread they make it into the history books. The most recent of those big floods happened in March of 2019. The stage was set for those floods by a long, cold and snowy winter between 2018 and 19, with January and March setting records for snowfall and temperatures remaining below freezing for nearly a month, freezing the ground to depths of nearly two feet, leaving it unable to absorb melting snow. Combined with a heavy rainstorm in early March, creeks and rivers reached record levels in hours with the town of Hornick and Woodbury County having to evacuate after a levee on the West Fork of the Little Sioux River broke, sending water rushing into the town. There was also the historic Missouri River flood back in 2011, which impacted all three Siouxland states, including major impacts in the Sioux City Metro. Parts of the Dakota Dunes community had to be evacuated due to rising waters, which also submerged much of the Sioux City Riverfront. Further downstream, the Winnevegas Casino near Sloan was only able to continue operations by bringing customers in through the floodwaters using duck boats. And parts of I-29 between Missouri Valley and the Missouri border were closed for months due to the high water and the damage they caused to the roads. Floods can happen in many ways in all seasons, not just spring and summer. First Alert meteorologist Jacob Howard is here to explain more about the different types of flooding that you can see here in Siouxland. According to the National Weather Service, flooding causes more deaths than any other weather-related hazard. But flooding can happen slowly, like with snow melt or ice jams, or very quickly in heavy rains, which we call flash flooding. Flooding from snow melt and ice jams are common along rivers, streams and creeks during winter and spring. As snow begins to melt, this allows ice to break apart and the ice then moves downstream. This ice then can get caught along the river and when this happens, all the water upstream gets held back, leading to flooding upstream. Then when the ice jam does break, it causes flooding to occur downstream. In 2019, Siouxland had an ice jam occur along the Niobrara River where it caused flash flooding and destroyed a bridge and the Spencer Dam. The Missouri River flooding in 2011 is another great example of how extensive the damage can be from a slower moving flood, all triggered by record snowfall way up in the Rocky Mountains of Montana and Wyoming. Flash flooding is the kind of flooding that causes the greatest loss of life. This type of flooding occurs in a flash, hence the name flash flooding. We normally see this when we see heavy rain over a long time or when a thunderstorm is moving slow over one area. A big danger of flash flooding is not knowing that the flash flooding is occurring. This is why it is smart to have something like your first alert weather app with you or a weather radio at your house to always get the most up to date information regarding weather alerts. If you know where the flooding danger is, you can then avoid driving in flood waters and possibly save your life. Remember, turn around, don't drown. Stay weather aware, Siouxland. Another type of flood warning we see issued often in Siouxland is an aerial flood warning. The National Weather Service says that's different from a flash flood because it happens more gradually and results in ponding or buildup of water in low-lying floodplains over a period of more than six hours from the start of a rainfall. Aerial floods may also cover a larger area than a flash flood, but can be just as dangerous to life or property. Building a kit will show you the essentials you should have on hand for dealing with the aftermath of a severe storm when the severe weather special continues. We've covered what types of severe weather we may see here in Siouxland and what to do to stay safe in each type. But what about after? 
What do you need to do before a storm hits in order to be prepared for what happens after it does? For the answer to that question, we turn to First Alert meteorologist Jacob Howard, who's got what you need to have in a storm survival kit. Severe weather can be something many people fear, but there are ways to prepare and ease that anxiety. The one thing I recommend having is a weather radio and our First Alert weather app. This will allow you to always have a way to hear new weather warnings just in case your power goes out. Another way to ease that anxiety is to always have a tornado survival kit ready in your house or car. Now, when it comes to making your survival kit, the one thing I recommend having is not one, but a few flashlights, a bunch of batteries, and a few rechargeable power banks. This will allow you to run your weather radio, flashlights, and keep your phone charged. Another item you will always want to have in your survival kit is going to be a first aid kit. This is for you to have in case you get injured and cannot get help right away. Be sure to add important medication to your first aid kit since getting access to a pharmacy after the storm passes could be a challenge. Food is something else that you want to add to your survival kit. You want to add some non-perishable food such as canned goods or crackers in case you do not have food for a few days. Water is also something you're going to want to have in your kit or near where you keep your kit because water will be shut off if there is a lot of damage. Just leave a case of water near your kit so you will not forget that water. The last two items you can have in your kit or near your kit is a whistle so you can signal for help if you do get trapped <laughs> and then have a helmet to protect your head from flying debris or just head to your kitchen and also grab one of your favorite pots that would do just as good. While well, Sue Lynn, severe weather can be scary and dangerous but hopefully this Tornado Survivor Kit helps make it not as scary. The best place to keep that kit is in the room in your house where you plan to take shelter from a storm, like your basement or closet. That way it's already close by if you are trapped by debris. Staying weather aware, there are a lot of options when it comes to learning about severe weather in your area. How you can stay up to date on your weather in your area when this severe weather special continues. So now that you know about the types of severe weather we could see here in Siouxland and how to stay safe when they happen, how can you find out when you need to take action? Thankfully, there are a number of tools available to help you do just that. First Alert Meteorologist Kat Taylor has more on that. Tornado sirens are said to be the song of our people in Tornado Alley, but here's a friendly reminder that warning sirens are strictly meant to alert people outdoors. Some counties may sound for hazards in addition to tornadoes, including high winds and very large hail. It's a good idea to have multiple ways to get warnings like the KTIV First Alert weather app or an NOAA weather radio. You can always check in with KTIV on air and online for the latest. While you might not have a siren in your backyard, you can still get your hands on two different warning systems Kat mentioned. The NOAA weather radio is a radio like you might have in your bedroom, but instead of playing the latest hits or that old-time rock and roll, it tunes into special frequencies that let you know when the National Weather Service office nearest you issues an alert for where you live. You can buy one of those radios at most stores that sell electronics. There's also our First Alert weather app. First Alert meteorologist Carmelo Latuca has more on how you can set that up to alert you of severe weather near you. The KTIV First Alert weather app has a variety of tools at your disposal. You can see anything from hourly temperatures to the 10-day forecast and even the map so you can see satellite and radar. But how do you set up notifications for your area? All you have to do is hit the three bars on the right-hand side of the screen, go to location, and on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll hit the three dots next to where you are and you will enable notifications. You'll want to make sure your location services are turned on to do this, but how will they be announced to you and what type of announcements do you want? We'll go back to the three bars on the right hand side, hit settings and follow three simple steps. You'll want to hit KTIV alerts and turn those on. Then you will want to hit weather notification types and you can turn anything on and off from severe weather, precipitation, even winter weather if you so wanted to. One last step you have to follow is go to notification sounds, make sure those are turned on, Hit severe weather, for example, and you can find the way in which you want the announcement. You can have them announced to you in verbal format or even in an alarm sound. Doing these simple steps will make sure that you are informed when severe weather strikes. 
So hopefully now you know everything you need to remain weather aware this year and every year. If you missed any part of this special or want to watch it again, you can find it now online at KTIV.com and on our News 4 Now app on your smart TV. Thanks for watching and remember to keep your eye on the sky.